Hello and welcome to EV Loop powered by Car Loop. I'm Adrian Maidments. And I'm Riz Akhtar. Today we have a special episode of EV Loop. We have a guest. Riz, our we've first, got a guest. Our first guest. Yes. Uh, hi, Sam. Hi, Sam. Uh, how are you guys? I'm, I'm glad I'm the first ever guest. I can't wait. This will be the number one podcast ever. Yeah, I hope right? so. I should have said hi. But hello and welcome to Sam Corkies from EVSE. <laughs> Oh, thank you. No, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I've watched uh, a few of your videos already and all the new cars that are launching. Uh, and obviously, uh, with what Riz has been doing with Car Loop. So, yeah, very, very excited to be here. Thank you. I'll do the first question. Hi, Sam. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and EVSE as a co founder of EVSE? Yeah, so um, I've been in the EV industry for since 2015. I feel like a bit of a dinosaur. Um, that was uh, Tesla Model S, Nissan Leaf first gens, uh, the Outlander with the Type 1 plugs. Uh, you know, it was a mishmash of technology. You had Chatamo plugs, you had the Tesla DC plug, you had CCS1, CCS2. And um, to see where the EV industry has come over these last 10 years is, has been remarkable. Um, you know, I, I remember I, even my family was like, Sam, you should stick to being a pharmacist and not start an EV charging business. Um, I didn't listen because uh, I didn't really like being a pharmacist, uh, which uh, I'm pretty thankful that I'm not anymore. Sorry to if any pharmacists are listening. Uh, and then I started really humbly in a garage. Um, we, you didn't make much money doing anything EV in, in 2015. You sort of lost money. Um, and so for the next six years, I kind of had to convince, you know, my wife who I married in 2017 that eventually I would stop losing money and this would be a viable business and I wouldn't have to work on the weekends and do, you know, 80-hour weeks. Uh, and, and eventually, look, um, the Australian EV industry kind of started to mature. We started getting more and more EVs to the market. Tesla launched the Model 3. Um, and I, I think there's, there's still a lot of negativity kind of, in Australia about EVs, and I, I just don't understand it. Um, Australia, we're an energy superpower, but we import oil. You know, EVs are good whether you're right wing or left wing. EVs are good if you're liberal, Labor, or Greens. Like, like there's 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 positives for everyone. Uh, and honestly, I'm excited. I'm really excited over the next twelve months because, I you you said it to me, Riz, the other day, and Adrian, I think I said to you the other week as well, an EV today can travel 500 kilometers on a single charge. That's exactly the same as a petrol car. It's exactly the same. So all we need is infrastructure, exactly 500 kilometers away. You know, we need infrastructure everywhere. And like, what, what's beautiful about what, what I do is it's it's really proud, the proudest part. I like to tell my kids, oh, we installed that charger and uh, the competitor installed that charger, but it's okay, we're gonna use it anyway. Uh, we just need the infrastructure to, to match the quality of vehicle that we now have in Australia. Oh, yeah. that's great, Sam. Look, I mean, basically, we're starting this podcast by saying we got to make EV charging great again, because that's what this is about, and getting more infrastructure in the ground. Now, let me ask you a bit of a question. You sort of touched on this earlier as well. What got you into starting EVSC? Like, you know, I mean, you, you mentioned that, you know, you're your wife and others thought that you were, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing with this sort of stuff? What got you started yeah. in this space? Yeah, look, uh, it's funny. Like I, I, one of the earliest memories I had of an electric vehicle is I was, uh, I love those little hobby cars. And back in the day, you'd, you'd have to get these little nitrous kind of cars that ran on this really special fuel. And they were god awful. Like the spark plug would never work. They, they'd blog, bog up all the time and you'd be servicing them as much as you'd be driving them. And then they'd go like 60, 70 Ks and they were great. So I was in Parramatta at the hobby shop with my brother. And we the hobby guy's like, you don't want this this petrol one or nitrous. You want this, this new lithium battery um, remote control car. We put it on the ground after we charged it at home. And it was a rocket ship, Riz. It was a rocket. Okay, so a few years later, I'm in Amsterdam and I'm seeing electric cars street side plugging in. And you know what I thought to myself? Oh, I'm back at home in that little toy car. This is, it's just a 130th model, but it's, it's real. I'm seeing it. And so I was an idiot. You know, I raced home, you know, got off the plow. I was like, 
I was starting an AV business. This is going to be huge. And it didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't huge for a long time. But I, I'm someone who likes technology at, at the core of what I do. And I'm someone who, who believes that electric vehicles are a better piece of technology. And they have an added bonus that they're actually better for the environment. Uh, you know, people can say what they say about the batteries, right? Yeah, we've got to mine the batteries. We've got to mine the steel that we put in the car engine as well. Like it, There is a cost. There's an environmental cost to everything we do. But um, from a technology perspective, they're actually fantastic vehicles. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, that, that yeah. story around, you know seeing it in a hobby store to seeing them in person. I had my first attempt was when I was an intern at Bosch and they had a Mitsubishi Maev just as a rental to trial around. So I was driving it around in Melbourne, just around the streets and thinking, this is, this is cool. There's something there. That was in 2010. But, you know, uh, it's it, a lot has changed. And as you said, you got to see it in Europe and now finally here. So I guess let's get, get a bit into EVSC sort of, what are the what are the main problems that you're trying to solve for your customers today with the business? And I guess just on the back of that, are you seeing any changes in customer requirements as the industry matures a bit? Yeah, I, I th there's there's multiple challenges that we're trying to solve. Um, you know, how do we get uh, cost effective uh, charges in someone's home? They can connect into solar so that they can power their car for free. From the fleet side, how do we make transitioning easy? Because You've never had to think about the infrastructure when you bought a car. You used to just say, oh, you know, you take it to the amp, I'll fill up, you're done, get on, get on your way. These days, it's, it's not as simple, right? There's a learning curve, especially in fleets, and fleets are 52% of all cars that are sold in Australia are fleets. And so we need these guys to, to really transition. You've got to deploy infrastructure that's cost-effective, right? We just can't give them a $300,000 bill for five cars and say, well, You'll save that money eventually. It doesn't work that way. You, you got to deliver value today and then enduring value in the future. And then I think the biggest challenge in Australia right now is, is public infrastructure. We need more public infrastructure and we're helping to build that infrastructure for, for some of the biggest companies in this country. And then trucks and buses, they really power this country. But they're, they're hard to electrify. I'll admit, I'm the, I'm the biggest EV convert, you, you know, maybe only behind you you and Adrian, Riz. Um, they have a very tough time because, you know, they need massive batteries and they carry massive payloads. And, you know, they're, they're only going 300 kilometers at the moment. That's not that magical 500 kilometer mark. And so big costs and big challenges with the electrical grid associated with them. But these are not challenges that we can't solve. It just requires you know, more of a solution kind of design and a longer term focus. And so um, obviously we've launched some new initiatives around there to kind of what I call smooth out that transitional, the savings that you get with diesel that you can transition to infrastructure. So that, that, um, that's great, mate. I mean, the thing is, you know, what, uh, the, the challenges, as you said, are there and they're not something that we can't solve today. I guess let's look at your business and what are some of the biggest opportunities you're seeing? Is it off the back of those challenges? Absolutely. I think the, the, the bigger the problem you solve, um, the, the more fun you have. Um, I've, I've gotten gray hair kind of uh, over the last few years trying to tackle these bigger problems. And that's how do we augment the grid so that we can get more power to the site, what I mean by solar and batteries. How do we kind of take advantage of cheaper electricity? So your, your big truck or your big electric car fleet can charge at 10 cents a kilowatt instead of 30. Um, and so... Uh, we develop a lot of our own products. You know, we augment products that we bring in from overseas and, uh, you know, making sure that the firmware works accordingly and warranties are strong. Uh, that, that's really the challenges that we focus, focus on every day. And, um, yeah, we're now also looking at kind of how we can make the cost of owning electric charging infrastructure lower. Uh, that's, that's really a key here of what we're doing. Have I answered your question good enough, Riz? I feel like I was sort of rambling. Hey, hey, hey this you know, your rambling is the answer because okay. we're hearing it from, from you right here. Yeah. I guess the, the, the thing is, you've just touched on it at the very end, reducing the upfront cost. Now, I heard something the other day and it really perked my ears on this concept uh, when I, I guess, visited the HQ in New South Wales of EVSC of charging as a service, C-A-A-S. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that initiative and 
I think, yeah, uh, our listeners and viewers will be quite intrigued to see how that's going to help drive more infrastructure into the ground. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we, we have a crystal ball in Australia. That's uh, Norway. So, you know, I spy with my little eye what's happening in Norway. And, and they're at 90% EV uptake. So they, these are the challenges they're fake, fake, uh, facing. Um, the big challenge that Australia faces is we're a big country with populations uh, 1,000 kilometres away for some reason. you think the British would have kind of concentrated on us, but they sort of wanted to put us everywhere. Um, and then on top of that, right, infrastructure in Australia has not been reliable enough. It's been a sell and forget mentality, right? Like the charges installed, we've made our money by. And, and what that unfortunately has led to is around Christmas time, when people are traveling on roads, there's a loss of confidence. We need to make Australians and EV drivers more confident in the infrastructure. We need to ensure that that infrastructure, especially DC charging infrastructure, fleet, trucks, and on the go, will grow with you and you're not going to have a technology risk. And as you're making money, right, and what I mean by that is if you're owning a public charger, you can make some money on that charger so you can pay that kind of ongoing cost. And then in a fleet, you can use that monthly cost. So how charging as a service will work is rather than having to spend all that capital up front, you can kind of smooth it out, essentially like kind of uh, renting or leasing a vehicle, right? And it just goes into a small monthly cost. And often that monthly cost of owning that EV infrastructure in your depot is lower than the cost of actually filling up your uh, truck with diesel. So what you want to do is kind of take the money that you would have spent in diesel and reinvest it into electric vehicle infrastructure. And this is not a new concept. I haven't created anything revolutionary. Is They're doing this in Europe. In fact, in Europe, they're no longer buying charges. They're all kind of going down this path of kind of partnering with the likes of EVSC or any other company that offers this to, to maybe offer a different form of solution. Now, I don't think it's right for everyone, but I, I genuinely think big companies that, that have big fleets that have, um, you know, need to have high uptimes, that need to ensure that their fleet is operational, that have big kind of challenges around electric infrastructure, this is for them, yeah. That's that's great, Ben. And I mean, look, um, I know I'm not your marketing consultant here, but okay. how about charging as a service is a great concept. How about we call it charge now, pay later? Yeah, even better. There's after no paying, right? <laughs> Wait, exactly. It's, it's, it, it's EVSC is the after pay for charging. Uh, for yeah. Absolutely. Like whatever way you want to talk about it, it's, it's hard to stump up so much capital at the front end, right? You, they talk about total cost of ownership of electric vehicle is, is, is lower over time. We agree. So you want to kind of smooth out that kind of big initial outlay as much as possible. You want to get that cost parity with petrol straight away because then it's easy to justify to managers. It's easy to justify to, you know, an organization to do that transition. And if it doesn't work, it's our problem, you know, and people love that, right? You you can't run away from it, you know. It's like if you're if if Optus doesn't kind of let the data happen, as you've all seen across this country, you got a big problem. So it's sort of um, it transfers risk from the um, the fleet operator to EVSC, and we're we're comfortable with that risk because we're the right person to own that risk. And, and you've done it before, right? I think that's the key thing. You've done it before, you know the reliability and the quality of the hardware that, um, you know, EVSC is providing today to, you know, public charging all the way up to some of the largest fleet operators. And yeah. who better to tackle that problem in that way? Um, and, and like you said, it's de-risking it. We're, the more barriers we can remove from, you know, our decision makers, uh, I, I, well, eyesight, the better it is because that's what this whole thing is supposed to be about and that way you can get so many more charges in the ground um i guess shifting gears a little bit are you sure you don't want to be in the marketing department mate we can uh <laughs> you can you know, you know, we, we, we'll, we'll get a whiteboard up you know we'll, we'll you can get the black pen i'll get the green pen so yours is more important that's green you can have the blue one we'll, we'll put some thoughts together <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll make it yeah we'll, we'll get the marketing humming so I, I think we've touched on the technology, where things are at today, why we need to do it, and why it's critical. I guess being one of the leaders in that space, Sam, in Australia, um, 
for charging it as, as a service, what do you see is the future of this this sort of offering? Do you see it evolving over a period of time like standard sort of charging offering has been? Or do you sort of see that here it is now and everyone can sort of make the most of it today? Uh, absolutely. Look, look, there's an immediate need right now. We need people, you know, if you want to buy the infrastructure, buy it. If you want to use a public uh, charger, do it. I believe in charging everywhere you go. Uh, I don't think there's a one size fits all. This is not going to ever be a petrol station kind of uh, with EVs. You can charge at home, charge at work, and you're going to charge on the go. That's the reality. Anyone who tells you something different, I'm going to be a bit, little bit political here. They're wrong. It's everywhere. So how do we kind of make it cheaper is, is the first step. So you don't need to invest all your capital up front. The other thing is once you put the infrastructure in, what we need to look at is, okay, how do we make it cheaper for you to then use that infrastructure to charge your to charge your car? Now, we know in the day, we're blessed with sunshine. It's been a pretty hot winter, uh, maybe global warming, maybe. Um there's a lot of sunshine. Now, if you're charging your car during the day and, and you've got solar on your roof and you're exporting that solar, I've got great news. Let's not export that solar for six cents. Let's whack it into the battery of your EV and let's get you moving it essentially for free. So that's your first step. So that's your second stage. Stage three, stage four is, can we add a battery? Can we augment that solar that you have? Or can we use the grid during the day when there's an abundance of clean energy? And, and rather at five o'clock using those coal coal generators and gas burners are turned on then charge your vehicles using that battery and then finally you're already seeing it the, the major energies are going to be providing cheaper electricity rates i would love for my customers to tap into those cheaper electricity rates because you know once you own an electric car what's the next biggest cost it's fueling yeah it, it's it's the electricity and the infrastructure right so you own the car you're going to own that car I, look, in my, my opinion, I think the cars are going to be on for 10 to 15 years. I think we're going to have longer cycles, um, is, is infrastructure and, and charging. And once you install the infrastructure charging and, and so on, it's not going to go anywhere. It's like your air con. Yeah, Hopefully thanks. it's going to continue to, to cool your room. So we need we need rears. They've got to be more reliable, especially DC chargers. The industry has, over the last, as you know, there's been some big issues in Australia around DC chargers. Thankfully, the gear that we're installing now is working really well. We're having very good up times. We've kind of not had the challenges that others had, but it's not acceptable. You know, it's not acceptable to be throwing away big 200 kilos of metal in the bin or recycling it because it's not working well enough. I mean, the industry as a whole, from a sustainability perspective, needs to be better. Yeah, and I think that that's the key opportunity there as well, as you said, Sam, that, you know, You've got, we've got to look at the whole charging and let's call it refueling in the traditional day, the whole system better. You know, currently if you've got to fill up your diesel truck or car, whatever it is, you pay a static same rate. Well, actually you yeah. say the same rate, whatever is, whatever is the flavor of the day that your servo charges, where we have an opportunity to charge things in such a more efficient way. But at the same time, that same concept of, hey, what about this infrastructure they have? I got to see some of the some of the products at the HQ um, in Sydney when I visited a couple of weeks ago. And yeah, I mean, you you know, you know, and the team are implementing those DC fast charging reliable solutions into fleet customers. The, there is no, oh, it's not working today and we're waiting for it to be repaired. It's, it's business critical stuff. They'll be on the phone to yourself and the team to say, Sam's not working. So you've learned all of, all of those lessons but also you're providing a very reliable opportunity for them and then like you said the future is how do you do it with the solar battery clean energy augmentation make customers save money and they'll they'll listen and that's why they're listening today sam absolutely thank you and like for us we, we can supply the hardware we can install that software and 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 bring that solution together and that one point of contact, that, that's the hard part, right? There's a lot of people out there, they'll sell you hardware, they'll, they'll sell you software, or they'll sell you install. But putting it together and making it work reliably, uh, that's the secret sauce. That's the, you know, Sol Bay, the guy who does the, puts the salt in, in there. <laughs> that's the, the secret sauce, yeah, the, the MSG, the, the salt, the pepper. <laughs> Whatever you guy, whatever people want to call it. <laughs> so I think that's that, that that's awesome. Like you know, we've got 
a bit of a future into what the well a bit a, a bit of a look into the future of what the charging industry could look like. Now, let's change gears once again, Sam, to yeah. a bit more about you. Yeah. What EV do you drive today? I still drive, and I'm pretty embarrassed. It's just the stand, like the Tesla Model Three. I did buy the performance because, um, you know, it's a three second car for under a hundred k. It's it's pretty good value. Uh, I, I love the look of the Polestar. I like the look of the BYD seal. Um, and, and some of the, the new Chinese brands have got me a bit excited as well. I, I never thought I would look at like the Chinese brands, but I'm, I'm genuinely interested in the Chinese. They're, they're putting together pretty good packages. Um, and then, you know, the bigger SUVs, like I like the Kia EV9. It's just, you know, just... Big stance. Put muscle, you know, it looks like... Yeah, it looks like a, Remember the early days of the electric cars? They all looked like little um, cartoon cars from the Jetsons. Hey, mate, Mitsubishi Maya. Mitsubishi. Yeah. And and I remember my business partner, Brendan, would say, mate, we've got to stop making these cartoon EVs. Like, And then you see the EV9, you're like, whoa. Yes. I think the Cybertrucks the, is a bit over the top. I, I, I don't know. Part of me just says, ah, oh, you know, big American muscle too much. But yeah. Each, each to their own. And that's where the... The Kia EV9 has sort of, you know, changed the landscape in 2024. Those mm. EVs can be muscly. They can have seven seats and they yeah. can they can tow and they tow well. So, yeah. yeah. And I guess what would be your dream car if money was no object, Sam? You know, the Model 3 Performance is a good car, I know, because I've got one. Mm. But, you know, what would be your dream car? I think everyone, you know, I think uh, the, the Monza F1, you know, a red Italian sports car like every, um, you know, every middle-aged man going through a midlife crisis would probably be. Um, obviously, I, I'm waiting for more uh, electric. I'd love to see some electric supercars. I know there is some, but I haven't really seen any in Australia. I, know, I think Maserati is bringing one out. Uh, yeah. The new GT Maserati will be electric. So we're looking forward to seeing that. Uh, you know, the Roadster, I don't know, man. I'm a bit... I don't really have like a yeah, just Italian, I guess. Why not? Yeah, look, I think I've uh, you know <laughs> Rolls Royce has done their Spectre, not a sports car, but you know they they're all doing a flavor of something like that. But yeah, you're right. I think you know one of the sports cars. I'm looking for the um, you know the new 911s, the electrics. Yeah. If that if that eventually makes it in, but like you said, the Chinese are making some really really good high performance cars. Um, you know, I, it would be good to see more options, as you said. You know, the the cars don't all need to look like out of Jetsons, um, yeah. and some of those new models will definitely make it there. Now, I guess one final question before we'll let you ask a question, if that, if you'd like. Yeah. Um, where do you think the future of the EV industry is heading here in Australia? Yeah, look, it, it's it's interesting, right? Because the US and Europe kind of introduced some pretty big tariffs, right? And and that for me is going to say, well, if you're an, an automaker, I think the Europeans and, and the US are going to concentrate on their market. It, it's pretty clear that we may actually see a little few less American and, and European. I think Asian uh, EVs, uh, South Korean, Japanese and, and, and Chinese are going to really be popular here. I think we're going to see some really interesting price points. Um, for a long time, EVs were high price let's be honest like you you look at um you, you look at a kona it's it's normally tw yeah 30 to 40 grand and uh, the ev version is relatively high compared to that i'd love to see that come come closer EVs are going to cost more there is a little bit more too and there's a lot more tech um but yeah just to make it a little bit easier at the front end um is the thing and i think lower cost evs i'm really excited about and i can't wait maybe i'm just a sucker i'd love to see a thousand kilometer ev I think it possibly wouldn't be the best use of battery to to wait, but, you know, something different. There are opportunities there, Sam. And as you sort of say that there's this shift, right, where up until recently, I think last month, MG announced a 10-year warranty on their EVs. They've got, I think, the MG ZS EV, uh, MY23 was selling for 35 grand drive away. We're yeah. starting to see some killer deals when it comes to yeah. that sort of stuff. And... As you said, affordability, product choice, um, and you know that that confidence around being able to charge anywhere, that's going to be quite unique. And obviously, you're solving the charging problem. You've looked at the tariffs in other markets and how that's going to bring a whole lot more affordable and 
other sort of different segment of EVs into the market. I think it's it's a really, really exciting time. Have you seen a time like this before, like, you know, around the cars and EV charging in your nearly 10 years of doing EVSE? I, I think the the range of products and services available now, both in charging, both in the vehicles, is at the point now where uh, anyone logical can make an informed decision and can actually buy something that's not going to be technology um, outdated very quickly. That was a big risk. Or I was going. That was the question I was going to ask you. Um, oh, you know, they, you can buy something with confidence now. Thirty-five grand. What's the running cost on an MG with a thirty-five grand buy point? What is it? Ris- I, I charge my Tesla at home with my solar charger. Yeah. You know, the Ocular IQ Home Solar. You know, I'm product plug, you know, got to put that, hey. put that as a note in the in the thing. But I, I charge my car from solar. And then, you know, I, I charge at work and I charge on the go. And I love it. But I just think the, the, the value you can now get, it's insane, isn't it? It's it's And it's the thing is it's getting lower and lower when it comes to, and like you said, EVs are naturally going to be a little bit more expensive. They're not producing as many of them. But the opportunity it creates because of those tariffs in uh, the US, Europe. Um, I got a call. I was up in Byron Bay with Smart last week. I got a call from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation because they yeah. slapped on 100% tariffs. And they're saying, what do the Aussies think about Chinese EVs, particularly the BYD stuff? And I said, ultimately, you're hindering innovation for your own industry. More competition, yeah. the better it is. And we will see the benefit of that as well. And I, I you know, I, I think there's at least another ten brands launching in the next twelve months, and all of that is really going to shake things up. And hopefully, it will create a tremendous amount of opportunities for the kind of work that you, Brendan, and the team at EVSC have been doing, Sam. And I thank you for your time. And yet, you know, I'm I'm sure that our listeners and others, because this will go out everywhere. We're, we're, we're hoping to make this global, Sam. So. Yeah. This will go out everywhere and hopefully you get many of those listeners coming in and just wanting to learn more about charging as a service and what EVSC does. And yeah, I can't. you're also in New Zealand as well, I should probably. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, land of the long white cloud, we're there. Yeah. Uh, New Zealand's a great country for EV charging. <laughs> I'm over there and they're like, oh, we don't know about these EVs. I'm like, you're an island that's, you know, a thousand k's from the top to the bottom and you go north and south. You got no oil and petrol's three bucks. Like this is like perfect. It's like the most perfect market. It's the most perfect market for EVs. It, guys, it, it, if you want to know the most perfect market to put an EV, it's an island, right? It's it's just it works. I, I don't know, man. I, I could go. You know, let's get those hats made. You know, I want to get those hats made ASAP. <laughs> We will, we will, and when Sam and I often talk, we know our main motto is make EV charging great again. And in yeah. an island where you can get from pretty much, you know, you're, you're isolated anyway, you might as well create your own energy and use it and not be reliant on anything else. And it's best if it's cleaner during the middle of the day. And the more charge points we can have in the ground, the more opportunities there are. At your home, at your workplace, any shopping center, anywhere people park their cars, there should be charges. And I think, you know, EVSE will play a big part in that as well. So thank you so much, Sam, for your time. I uh, hope you, Brendan and the team are doing an awesome job and uh, keep it up. And I'm sure we'll, we'll get you back on in a, you know, in a couple of weeks' time. I can't wait. Oh, man, uh, you guys, whenever you want, man, invite me. I'm, I'll have an opinion on anything. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you talking. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you for your time, guys. Great luck. Thank you.